subject of a famine. And the word famine, of course, it, it means a time of desolation, a time of lack, a time of insufficiency. Uh, there's, there's different aspects of famine, and we talked about that to some extent. Actually, we could deal with eight different realms of famine. There is personal famine. There is emotional famine. You know, it's like you, sometimes you go through this emotional famine where everything is just like you're in a de desert, you're in a wilderness. It's the valley of the shadow of death, and you just feel like you're not going to come out the other side. It just it, it feels like there's no hope, there's no future, there's no tomorrow. So there's personal famines, there's emotional famines, you know. There's uh, psychological, mental famines, you know, that we go through. There's, there's financial famine. There's, uh, uh, there's what we call national famine, global famine. There's, there's, there's uh, uh, churches that go through a time of famine. Just like you're going through a wilderness or a desert or a time of lack, or a time of insufficiency. Uh, and, and, and every man of God, every woman of God has always gone through famines. Abraham went through a famine. Isaac went through a famine. Jacob went through a famine. And, and here's the amazing thing, which we're going to deal about this morning. A lot of times, God will actually literally lead you into a place of famine. Now, see, a lot of people's concepts of God are, are all wrong. And, and, and in the Old Testament, see, a lot of times we get to thinking we understand God, we really know God. And even Job, that was a part of Job's problem. Job thought he really knew God. Now, don't understand, Job did know God to some extent, but he did not know all of God. He didn't know all of the workings of God. As a matter of fact, I think it's in Job chapter 40 when God finally showed up and said, Job, where were you when I did this and that and thus? And Job says, I abhorred myself in sackcloth and ashes. He said, I was a foolish man. I, I uttered two things uh, too wonderful to be spoken. And so Job came out of that famine. You might call it a famine. Job came out of that time of testing, hardship, trials, lost everything. He came out of that stronger than when he went in. And he became twice the man. Well, how do you know that, Pastor Mike? Because the Bible says, may you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospereth. And so Job went in one way and he came out another. Now, the danger about famine or the danger about going through a desert or a wilderness is a lot of people, God's people, who go in never come out. They die in the wilderness. They die, they die in that, that place, that desert place. But see, that's not God's will. God's will is that you pass through the valley of the shadow of death. That what, what is, it could be evil actually is to your good. That you become stronger, you become wiser, you, 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 you become closer to God, you become more knowledgeable. Matter of fact, the psalmist says, it was good for me that I was afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. That I might learn thy statutes. Now, this, what I'm sharing with you this morning is all biblical. It's, it's through all of the Bible. But a lot of times what we do is we kind of pick and choose what we'd like to eat out of the book. But, but you know, we need to do what, what, what Moses told the children of Israel to do in, in the Passover lamb. He said, eat all of the lamb. Eat all of the lamb. Uh, uh, you know, in our culture, we don't eat the tongue. We don't eat the eye. We don't eat the brain. We don't eat a lot of the innards. But in a lot of other nations, be, because they're such desperate people, they eat all of it. And, and I've been there. I mean, there's stuff I ate in the Philippines when I lived with the Yupik Indians in Alaska, when I was with, 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 with some of the in, in uh, and I know Brother Mark was with us in Mexico, Guatemala. And I tell you, you don't ask them what's in the food you're eating, you just simply eat it. Amen? And we need to eat all of this book. Amen? Can I hear an amen? Eat all of it. Even the parts you don't like. You, you know, it's funny. It seems like the stuff that children really need to grow and become strong and healthy and, and, and vibrant, you know. How do you all think you got as good looking as you got? Amen? Because your parents made you eat the stuff you didn't want to. Isn't that right? I hope they did, you know. I'm telling you, my, my, I think my dad went out of the way to find food that we would not like, and he made us eat it. And you know what? I like it now. I enjoy it now. Hey, there was a time I didn't like spinach. I didn't like asparagus. I didn't like turnips. I didn't like, you know, but, man, you can give it to me now, and I'll eat it. I, I'll eat it all day long, but, you know, I got to have a little bit of butter with it, you know. Or you might say, I have, I have a little bit of vegetables with my butter. <laughs> but it's important for us to get fed properly. And that's what Jesus told Peter. He said, Peter, do you love me? Well, yes, Lord. Well, feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. So look what it says here in Luke chapter 1. We're going to look at one of the greatest prophets that ever, ever lived up to the day of Christ. 
in chapter 1 of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verse 13. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth, for he shall be great. Now get a hold of this prophetic utterance over the life of John. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor straw drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. Now, if we would stop the story right there, you'd say, oh, this is wonderful, this is marvelous, this is awesome. But what you need to understand is that what God is saying over John's life was not sufficient for the job to be done. There was something much more involved. He was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. Now, don't misunderstand me. Praise God for the Holy Ghost. But here's the thing. A lot of people have the Holy Ghost, but the Holy Ghost don't have them. See, a lot of people have Jesus, but Jesus doesn't have them. See, that's just the beginning. I mean, John is filled with the Holy Ghost. He doesn't drink wine. He doesn't live immorally. He doesn't do ungodly things. He, and, 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 and here this prophetic utterance is going forth. But that didn't mean that John was going to succeed. Some other things were involved in this. Notice what it goes on to say here. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go up before him in the spirit and the power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedience to, to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, so in other words, this, this man, John the Baptist, and we don't know a lot about him because he was so outshined by Jesus, but th this man was one of the greatest prophets Jesus said that had ever lived. What made this man great? What made this man awesome? What made this man powerful? Why did God use this man in such a wonderful way? Take a look there now in Luke chapter 1, verse 67. This is the birth of Christ, I mean, of, of John the Baptist, and the Holy Ghost comes upon his father. And his father, Zacharias, as was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesying, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have since been since the, began, since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies, and from the hand of all, of all them that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our father, says to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. Now verse 76, talking about John. And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt be go, go before the face of the Lord to prepare his way. The Bible call, says he was the friend of the bridegroom. To give, listen, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of sins. Through the tender mercy of God, whereby the day spring from on high has visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Now, up to this moment, we're hearing these wonderful prophetic utterances about John the Baptist, filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. God's going to use him in a mighty way. And then all of a sudden, there's this one more verse that talks about John, and then he shows up 30 years later. Look what it says, the next verse. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. Now, now, that seems like a small, insignificant statement. But here, the greatest prophet that has ever lived, and it says that in Matthew chapter 11, and God's going to use him in a mighty way, and how is God going to do it? He's going to do it on the backside of the desert. He's going to do it in the place of famine. He's going to do it in the, in the place of lack. He's going to do it in the wasteland. He's going to take this man into a place where normal people won't live. Uh, you know, what does that mean, Pastor Mike? It means that God had to take this man into a place where this man had to trust God in order to live. See, see we, we don't want to hear that kind of message. God had to take him into a place where he had to trust God for everything in order to live. Uh, have you ever been there? I've been there many times. Where I had to trust God. Where I had to believe God. 
You know, the greatest victories that we like to boast about are, are, are really the lives in the lives of people, the most difficult times in our lives. You know, I, I don't know about you, but when, when, if a lion would come out to devour me, I, you know, it tests my faith like David. If a bear was to come out to test me, it, it, it'd be kind of a challenge to grab a grizzly or a, a black bear by, by the beard and to slay him. Goliath or King Saul chasing David all those years or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be thrown into the fiery furnace after they have been captive by, by the Chaldeans and drug away from their home. Or Daniel in the lion's den. And so here we see a situation where this prof other, this tremendous, listen, when be somebody begins to prophesy an awesome ministry over your life, yeah, get excited about that, but realize from the time the prophecy goes forth into the fulfilling of that prophecy, there is going to be a wilderness experience. There will be a desert. There will be trials there will be tests there will be tribulations see a lot of people get a prophetic utterance and 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 they think whoa glory hallelujah god's going to use me god's going to flow through me god's going to speak through me god's going to do a mighty work for through me well that's true but look at the prophets of old what was involved in taking them to where they needed to get a lot of tests, a lot of trials a lot of tribulations matter of fact paul said we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of god so there's a lot of tests, there's a lot of trials. And what is the purpose of that? Well, we'll look, but look there now in Matthew chapter 3. All of a sudden, John shows up. He's been in the wilderness all this time. Now, I'm telling you right now, if you're going to make it in a time of famine, and a lot of people won't make it, I'm just telling you that right now, a lot of people won't. I, I, don't, really, I don't really read a lot of news, but I know I see headlines where, where things aren't even near as bad yet. Well, you, Pastor Mike, I rebuke that. Don't prophesy. Don't prophesy famine. I don't have to prophesy famine. You just got to have enough wisdom to know it's coming. The Bible says a wise man sees a lion coming and he turns aside, but a, a foolish man wanders on and is devoured. You, you gotta, I, I knew over a year ago what was going to happen in my heart. Matter of fact, I did on my e, in, in my email alerts. I, I put on there, anytime a bank begins to collapse or a bank uh, closes down, send me an email alert. And, and through the last year and a half, I began to watch it multiply, multiply, multiply. Banks closing here, banks closing there. I mean, they're shutting down. I just, I just saw a headline in Alabama, in California, another place, other banks shut down. And they're consolidating. You know, we're moving into this new world banking order, you know. One of the major, Europe, major European sp spokesmen this week said, said, we must have a global economic system. Well, brothers and sisters, rejoice because when you see these things begin to come to pass, it says, lift up your head because your redemption draweth nigh. See, it is gloom and doom for those who aren't walking with Christ, those who don't know Christ, those who don't love Christ, those who don't follow Christ. It is gloom and doom for them, but not for us. But here's one key. If you're going to make it through the time of famine, you must not complain. You must not gripe. You must not moan. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. You must not, if you are in a negative stream, a negative confession, a negative attitude, a negative outlook, for your sake, get out of it. It's not of God. Now, we don't deny reality. We don't deny things that are going on. And, 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 and see, that's the ten, the ten spies. See, they went into the promised land, and they came out with a negative report, an evil report. Now, what they said was true, but where they made the mistake is they missed the God equation. See, they were looking to themselves. You know, some trust in the horses, some in chariots, but we remember the name of the Lord our God. And, and let me tell you something. Your prosperity, your success, your victory is not dependent upon your bank account, your checking account, your savings account, how many gold bars you got buried in your backyard. And by the way, I don't have none, so don't go digging there. <laughs> I'm just saying, Job ended up with nothing. I mean, he lost everything, but when he came out the other side, he had twice as much as what he had when he went in. Come on, man. Yeah, but Pastor Mike, what if, what if in the natural I end up with nothing? Well, listen, if you got heaven, you got it all anyways. But I'm simply, I'm, I'm not preaching a poverty mentality. I'm, I'm preaching an attitude. You, I'm telling you what, there is such a, a negative, negative, negative attitude that is, 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 is flooding our nation and the world. 
see? And we dare not let this thing affect us. And, and you got to fight it. I mean, you got to fight by faith. You cannot murmur, gripe, or complain. Now, here, John the Baptist, as a young man, the Spirit of God takes him into the desert, out with the jackals and out with the, with, with the, with the serpents and the snakes and the scorpions. I'm telling you right now, the Spirit of God within John the Baptist would not allow him to murmur, gripe, or complain. Hello? And not calling judgment. John, remember John, John and James, they said because the Samaritans would not receive Christ when he came through, he said, oh, let us call fire down from heaven. And Jesus says, you don't know what spirit you're of. We got to watch what spirit we're in, people. See, and they were convinced. Matter of fact, Jesus said they will kill you in my name. They'll think they're doing God a favor by killing you. Listen, we don't do a God favor killing you. The only person you have a right to kill is the old man in your heart, the flesh. That's the only person you have a right to kill. You have no authority to kill anybody else. Amen? You ain't got right, no right to use your mouth to kill your wife, to kill your husband, to kill your kids. Let the Holy Ghost do that in them. Amen? Amen. Good preaching whether you know it or not. So I, I want you to see here, you, you must not, this, this is some basic information. If, if you don't get anything out of today, get rid of a murmuring, griping, negative attitude. Now, I'm not talking about being positive just to be positive. No, we're positive because we look to Jesus. If God be for me, who can be against me? God's within me. God's my help. God's my hope. God's my rest. God's my peace. I told you this last summer, I went through the scriptures and I discovered over 1,200 types, names, and examples of what Christ does for us. Over 1,200. <laughs> Began to memorize them. You know, I'm still working on it. But I want you to get a positive attitude that God is with me. Why? Because I'm with God. His promises are true. He's faithful. He cannot lie. God is not a man that he should lie. So look what it says here in verse 1 of chapter 3. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Now listen, he's still in the wilderness. He's still in the wilderness. It, you know what? John never came into what we call the oasis in the natural, but he lived there in the spiritual. You can have an oasis in the desert. That's where oasis are, in your heart. I mean, everything in the natural can look bad, but in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. L listen, this is the key to having victory because, you know, Paul and, 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 and Barnabas, they're, are, are, they're in prison, their heads are in stocks, and they've been whipped and beat, and at midnight they begin to worship and praise God. At midnight. In the depths of the deepest prison, part of prison they can put them in. And, and, they're, and, and they weren't near as nice as the American prison system. I'm telling you right now, man. And they are singing and praising God. And you know what? God sent an earthquake for them. Busted open the bands, opened up the prison doors, and brought revival. And, and that's what God does in the desert. That's what God does in the wilderness. That's what God does in the time of famine. I want you to know that's where God shows up. He shows up in the famine or in the wilderness. Moses in the wilderness, God showed up. Abraham in the wilderness, God showed up. Pastor Mike, are you telling me that I've got to go into a wilderness in order for God to show up? No, I'm not telling you that you've got to go into a place of wilderness, but I'm telling you in the wilderness, in the desert, in the hard time, in the bad time, in the valley of the shadow of death, God shows up if you'll look to him. And here's another key. God will even show up many times when you don't look to him. I mean, that's what God, in, in, the, in the deepest, uh, uh, darkest moment of my life, and actually this coming, the 18th, I, I got born again in 1975, February the 18th, and as I was committing suicide, as I was taking a knife to my wrist and, I, and, and, and weeping, I was going to cut my wrist with everything in me, and the fear of God fell on me, and I knew that I was going to hell. I knew I deserved hell. I knew I belonged in hell. The Holy Ghost fell on me, and I cried out to Jesus. I repented of my sins, and Jesus gloriously came into my heart and rescued me in my wilderness. In my valley of the shadow of death, in my agony, in my despair, in my, in, in my problem. Why? Because where iniquity abounds, grace is much more abound. And the darker it gets, the brighter God becomes. 
or the reality of who God is. So here he is in the wilderness, and he said, Repent, for the kingdom of, of heaven is at hand. For this is he that has spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare you the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair, le a, a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Now, why would God be telling us that? Because, listen, you, you got to understand, your success is not dependent upon what you wear. What you wear doesn't make you spiritual. Amen? Now, what you wear can reveal where you're at spiritually. It can reveal where you're at spiritually. But what you wear doesn't make you spiritual. You know, if, if I wear minister's collar, it doesn't make me any more godly or any more anointed to the Lord if I wear a tie or if I don't wear a tie. Hello? I mean, it doesn't matter if I wear a Hawaiian shirt or if I just wear a suit. It, he was wearing, you know, I'm so glad that John was not setting up a, a requirement of ministers. We all had to wear camel's hair, you know. Well, Pastor Mike, you're not a prophet of God. You don't wear camel's hair and you don't eat ho uh, locusts and wild honey, you know. No, that has nothing. It's simply saying, listen, you got to look to God. Now, look there because Jesus didn't dress like that at all. See, I just love the contrast before, between Jesus and John. And that shows us the range of possibilities. You, you see what I'm saying here? When we begin to set up a criteria based upon clothing or the cars we drive or the jewelry we wear, we're in trouble. See, there's a contrast. Here John is, camel's hair, locust, wild honey. Here Jesus is, he ate, he drank almost anything, and he just nat he dr dressed like everybody else did. So don't get caught up in this stuff. That's not where the power's at. That's not where people say the anointing's at. That's not where the spirit's at. Now, notice what it says here. I'm going to show you this is so important. Chapter 4. Then was Jesus. This is right after he's been baptized uh, of John in the river. Jordan comes up. The Holy Ghost comes on him in the form of a dove. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now, don't mis uh, misunderstand. He's not tempting Je the, God, God the Father's not tempting. The Spirit's not tempting Jesus. It says, let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted with any, any man. But he's led of the Spirit into a place of testing, trying. He's going to go through the pressure cooker. He's going to go through the furnace. And, 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 and of course, when the metal goes into the furnace, it, it, it begins to separate the impurities. But you understand, there was no impurities in Jesus. There was none. Uh, he says, the prince of this world comes, and he can find nothing in me. Now, you and I, we have impurities in our life. There's not a person. Matter of fact, Paul said, I have not yet apprehended that for which I've been apprehended. Paul had impurities. When I say impurities, I'm not talking about open rebellion of sin. I'm saying there's things, there's, there's things that have been passed on generationally. They have to be dealt with. There's things that have been passed on through wrong teaching, wrong training, wrong ideals, things we put in our eye gate, our ear gate, things that have come out of our mouth gate, out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. And when you begin to turn up the heat, when you begin to put it under pressure, when it begins to go through that valley, the shadow of death, what's going to happen is what's inside of you is going to begin to come to the top. With all of us, it's going to come to the surface. Now, it's what you do with it when it comes to the surface that's going to determine whether you make it or you, uh, if you make it or, 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 if, you, or, or, or if you break it. If, if you su survive or if you die, see? When, when the stuff begins to come to the top, you need to begin to scoop it off and get rid of it. See, uh, the natural thing, when we get under pressure, we begin to with this stuff beginning to come up, and a lot of stuff's going to be coming to the surface in the next couple of years, I'm telling you right now. A lot of junk in our society is going to come to the top, and you can play the blame game. If it wasn't for that husband of mine, if it wasn't for that wife of mine, if it wasn't for the government, if it wasn't for, you know, the Democrats or the, or the Republicans or the liberals or the conservatives. No, no, that's the, the issue is nobody else. It's your heart. Are you going to deal with your heart? See, David had garbage that came to the surface. David dealt with his heart. Yeah, it took a prophet of God to help him. A prophet of God had to confront him. And a lot of times that's what apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers do. They'll confront you with the word of God. But then you've got to deal with it. See, if David, see, Samuel tried to deal with King Saul. Saul had pride. Saul had disobedience. He had rebellion. Now, Saul could have dealt with it, but Saul excused it. 
he, he buried it like, like Achan did the wedge of gold in the tent, see? And, and so it brought death to his life. But David, when he was caught in adultery, in murder, which is pretty bad stuff, wasn't it? But David dealt with it. He acknowledged it. He said to the Lord, okay, God, whatever has to happen, let it happen. What, whatever you have to do, let, do it, Lord. See, that's where we got to come. Okay, Lord, whatever it takes. Now I'm talking to God. I'm not inviting the devil. He said, well, Pastor Mike, that's a dangerous prayer because don't you know the devil answered that? Well, wait a minute. If I ask the Father for, 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 for the Holy Spirit, he's not going to let me get a demon. If I ask for bread or an egg, that's what I'm going to get. I'm not going to get a stone. I'm not going to get a scorpion. So if I say to the Father, Father God, what, you know, whatever it takes, you know, whatever it takes. Now, don't misunderstand. I am not at all implying that sickness or disease is of God. You come against that. You rebuke it. You reprove it. But the Spirit of God led him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. You know, it says, don't be surprised at the fiery trial which is about to try you as though some strange thing has come unto you. Take a look at the life of Paul. Paul went through incredible things. You know why? Because he had an incredible calling. He had an incredible calling on his life. The greater the calling, the greater the pressure. The great, you know, a lot of these people, man, I want to be great in the kingdom. I want to be used in the kingdom. I want God to really flow through me. Well, get ready for all hell to break loose on you. Huh? But it's okay because when you come out the other side, you're going to come out in the power of the Spirit. You're going to come out refined like silver, refined seven times over. You're going to come out better than when you first went in if you deal with it right. If you deal, see, this is so important. You and I, with every, and, 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 and we're going into a global famine here, financial famine and other types of famine. There's a moral famine that's been in this nation for many years. And I'm telling you what, we, we can come out the other side, but you better do it God's way. Now, you might discover some things you're doing, it's not doing it God's way, so you have to make some change. You know, when you were driving your car, how many of you drove your car here this morning? Okay, and the rest of you were passengers, weren't you? <laughs> you know? But anyways, you had to make course adjustments. I know when I used to fly a plane, I'd get up there about 5,000 feet. I'd be flying a small Cessna, and the wind would be blowing, and I had, uh, 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 me, I, I had gauges in my cockpit that would tell me what direction I was going, what height I was at, what angle I was at, and I had to follow those things precisely. I, I had to fly, but not by sight, but by the gauges. And let me tell you something. You've got to do that spiritually. You've got to go by the word. Man, if you go by how you feel, you go by how it looks, you go by people's opinions, you go by everybody has an opinion. I tell people, opinions are like noses. We put them where they don't belong. No, people always tell you how to, And the thing is, I, you know what? It, 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 I, I got a carpenter that does all my work. I don't really tell him how to do his work. You know what? Because he's the carpenter and I'm not. You know, it's amazing how sometimes uh, people say, well, I, I understand where you're coming from. I understand. Well, listen, I, 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 I try to stay away from that. When people go through tragedy, when they go through hardship, when they go through difficulty, uh, you know, I, I don't, I, 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 because I, I really don't know, how come I wouldn't understand what's going on in somebody's heart? Because everybody's heart's different. See, everybody, that, that's what the Bible says. Weep with those that weep and rejoice with those that rejoice. See, if you're going to help somebody, you, you, you know, Jesus came down where we're at. Now, of course, he didn't, he, he, he didn't react like we react because he showed us. So you, you got to go to where people live and show them how to come out of it. You, you can't, don't leave them in that mess. Show, say, can I help you out of this situation? And matter of fact, it says, in meekness, instructing them that oppose themselves, if peradventure God would give them acknowledging of the truth, that they might repent. And may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. You know, a lot of people are taken captive by the devil in the wilderness or in the desert or in the time of famine. The devil takes them captive. The children of Israel that came out of Egypt, they were so full of Egypt that, that, that what God was trying to do, he, when he took them into the wilderness, listen, he was trying to get Egypt out of them. I'm telling you what's going to happen now to the body of Christ. God is going to let us go through the famine in order to get Egypt out of you. And if you don't let go of Egypt, Egypt will end up killing you in the wilderness. I mean, that's why we're seeing a lot of people. Yes, people well, I would have backslid if I would have had no problems. Duh. Hello. 
Well, if I didn't have to go through what I had to go through. Well, listen, you know what? One time I remember as a young Christian, there was what we called the shepherding group had just begun. And the Keaton Five. And let me tell you something about the shepherding group. I'm not against, you know, being a shepherd. But basically they thought they could make all the hard decisions for people. And they could deal with all the hard issues. And it didn't work. It didn't work because people, you know what? I, I know we got C-section births today, but there is no C-section spiritual new birth. And, and when you're given born to in the natural, there, there, a child goes through tremendous pressure. I, I remember I, was, I, I had the opportunity to deliver two of our own children, and I was there and delivered the third one with the midwife there. But two of them, the midwife wasn't there. And I remember when my wife gave birth to Danny, and when Danny first came forth, I, I, I thought, man, that is the ugliest thing I ever did see. Because the bones were all twisted and, you know, elongated and, you know, and I mean, he wasn't very good looking, you know, I mean, you know, if, if, you know, finally things began to get in shape and get in order, but it was a, it was hard on him. It was a hard birth on him. I mean, for your, for your shoulders and your head and your arms to be dislocated and your head to be longitated. Well, you know, I'm telling you what, people think the new birth is, is just so easy as a breeze. No, but you, you don't understand that, that that child, when it's conceived, has nine months before it comes through the canal of the mother. And it goes through this time of tremendous pressure. I'm telling you what, as a child of God, you are going to go through tremendous pressure. And that's why Paul said, I have fought the good fight. Why is it a good fight? Because I won. See, he that endures to the end will be saved. And, 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 and brothers and sisters, we, we got to have this, this. We can't have this poor me. Nobody loves me. Nobody understands me. Nobody cares about me. Nobody's got it as hard as I've got it kind of theology. You got to kill that. That's the old man. That's the old nature. You got to have the new nature. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. If God be for me, who can be against me? God meets all my needs according to his riches and glory. I can do all things through Christ. You know, this spirit of faith. Spirit of tenacity. While everybody else is walking around looking like they're dying, you're walking around. And, and I, I'm not saying that you, you're insensitive to people's needs. Don't be laughing and joking around people who are weeping and wailing and crying. But put your arm around them. And tell them in soft words you can make it. Come on, let's just look to God. Let's pray right now. Let's, let's just look to Jesus. Let's just believe. And so here he is. He's out in the wilderness. In verse 2, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterwards a hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, listen, he answered and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, I know we can read that very quick very, and, and, and treat it very lightly, but it is a very profound statement. It is profound. Because I'm telling you what, Jesus is in the wilderness. He's out there in the desert 40 days and 40 nights. He hasn't had no physical substance. And in the wilderness, the first words we, we hear out of his mouth in the famine is this. In the famine, this is so important. It is written. See, he, he, he didn't say what the word of God says. Well, isn't that what it means? It is written. No, I think we need to take a lesson here. You dare not operate out of your five senses in a time of famine. Lean not unto your own understanding, but trust the Lord with all the heart. If you can't say anything that's godly, don't say nothing at all. It's just better to seal your lips. What we need to do in the time of famine, it doesn't matter if it's emotional, financial, spiritual, uh, uh, dealing with your relationships, dealing with your job, dealing with your finances. You and I must do what Jesus said in the time of famine. It is written. What, what is it written, Pastor Mike? And you don't, need a, you don't need to quote a thousand scriptures. Jesus quoted one scripture each time. It is written, it is written, it is written. Guess what? When af after he spoke the word, he came out of famine into a time of abundance. He came out in the power of the Spirit. Now, I know this, this, this sounds ridiculous, and let me, let me just 
Praise God that people are teaching that we need to have intimacy God with God. We, it's all about fellowship with God. It, it's all about, you know, it's all about God loving me and me loving God. And this is all wonderful. But how do we know that Jesus loved the Father? Because he said it is written. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll love my words. See, if, if I told my wife, I, if my wife wrote me love letters and, 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 I, and, and put it in an envelope, sealed it up, and gave it to me, and she said, honey, do you love me? And I said, yeah, honey, I love you. Have you read my letters yet? No, no, I'll get to it, but I love you. And, and, and if this went on for a couple years and I've never opened up her love letters, she'd begin to doubt my love for her. See, because if I really love her, I'll love what she has to say. I love, I love, I told you this story many years ago. I, it, we've been married for about seven or eight years, something like that. And one day I come into the kitchen and, and, and I was passing a church and she was at the kitchen table and she was crying. And she had laid in front of her a pile of letters I had written to her love letters, you know. And, and I said, what are you reading, honey? And she's crying. She's, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, she didn't really answer me. So I picked it up. And I started reading that stuff. And I said, man, I can't believe I wrote this stuff. <laughs> but she was reading my love letters. Maybe she was reading of things that could have been. You know, I don't know. But, but, but here's the thing. She was going over my love letters. Listen, this is God's love letter to you. This is God's this is God's way of success. This is God's answer to you getting through the famine, getting through the hard time. It is written. Devil, you know, I just read that email that I had uh, that 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 was sent about the teaching I did last week. And it, what, what helped her? The word of God helped. It is written. Well, Pastor Mike, it just doesn't seem like the word of God works. Shut up. Don't say that. Don't say it doesn't work. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I didn't say this is, this is not cultic. Jesus says you can have whatsoever you say. What are you saying? I'm coming out the other side better than when I went in. I'm coming out stronger. I, I'm coming out with more wisdom, more knowledge. I'm coming out with, with you know, I'm, 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 I'm coming out in the spirit. I, I, God's going to, see, I, I believe that God's going to give birth to a, a, an amazing movement of the Holy Ghost in this time period. I really do. I believe, do you really, they believe, if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't have no hope. I'd probably, I'd probably go to the doctor and get some kind of mind-altering drugs to help me through this time. You know, get some kind of sedative, you know, and, you know, and just pop the pill, do it legally, and, you know, just walk around like a zombie for the next 10 years until we get out of this time period. No, no, I have great hope that God is going to do something amazing in my life as long as I'll follow his directions. If I'll do it his way. Now, if I do it the way of the world, I'm a goner. I got to do it God's way. See, you got you to get a hold of this, brothers. Do it God. Go back. I'm going to show you what, what, before we do that, go there to Matthew chapter 11, please. And then we'll jump back to Deuteronomy 8, and we'll get into the meat of what God is wanting to do in the time of famine. Look what it says here, Matthew chapter 11, verse 11. See, I think the body of Christ, not to a whole extent, except for what we, and, and still out of all the groups, I'll say this, and all honestly, I do not agree with everything in the camp that I, I, I used to run with, the Word of Faith group. But yet, I'm telling you what, out of all the groups, they're about as close as I can discover of people who really know what it means to trust God. They really, I'm talking about speaking the Word. Now, all of these different flows, these different rivers or streams, I believe God's going to bring them together. As a matter of fact, Smith Wigglesworth, the last thing he prophesied, you can find it on the Internet, and, and the year he died, he prophesied that there was, he prophesied the movements of God. He really did. He prophesied, he actually specifically used the word movement and the spirit movement. He said at the end, he said, and he talked about the Zuzu Street Revival. He talked about all the different movements. He said this is not yet the last great movement. He said the last great movement is the, when the word movement and the spirit movement comes together, there will be a tremendous explosion, and the power of God will flow like it's never done before. It's what we call in the book of James the early and the latter rain coming together because of the Lord of the harvest. And that's what we're coming into right now. 
And, and, and actually, I've had speakers in here last year and in this coming year. I would have never thought about having coming in, in in all these years I've been ministering. But God spoke to me. And you know what? I'm finding a lot of these people, they're not as far off as what I thought they were in my head. They're not there. You know, I thought, man, they're way out there. And a lot of them are teachable, I'm finding out. Not all of them. But the ones that are teachable, see, God is, God is doing a stirring in the hearts of leadership. God is doing, he, he, people are beginning to understand we're coming into the end. We're coming into the grand finale. We're coming into the climax. We're coming into the fulfillment of the return of Christ. And he's coming back for a bride without spot or blemish or wrinkle or any such thing. But he's coming back for a glorious church. Full of the Holy Ghost. Full of the fire of heaven. Full of the power of God. Full of the word of God. But you got to go through the desert. You got to go through the shadow, the valley of the shadow of death. You got to go through. Tell somebody, I'm going through all the way. I'm coming out the other side. Amen. I don't want you to be a statistic. I don't want you to be somebody who didn't make it. Amen. And I, do the, I believe this also, that there's people who have fallen by the wayside in the last, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. God's going to bring them back in. I really do. I believe they're like the prodigal son. In the time, listen, the prodigal son, rebellious son. Whoa, I could preach this all day. A son who had blew his father's inheritance. When he got into the time of famine, he remembered his father. He said, I'm going back home. I'm telling you right now, people are going to come back home that we never thought would come home. And they're going to come back humbled and meek and obedient. And they're not going to have this uppity, better than, I, I, I'm better than you attitude. But he came home to the father. He says, Father, I'm not even worthy to be called your son. He said, let me be one of your servants. And that's when the father put on him the, the robe on his back and the ring on his finger and the shoes upon his feet. And he killed the fatted calf. I'm telling you, ready for a party? See, we can, we can have a party in the midst of the, uh, of the famine. Isn't that wonderful? Preach myself happy. Is that okay? Is it okay to be happy in a time of famine? Oh, Pastor Mike, you're not in a time of famine. I'm not going to tell you what I'm, gonna, I'm going through because it is written. It is written. God has met my needs. <laughs> so when you get a bundle full of piles and you get this and the taxes and you go, Hallelujah, God, <laughs> devil, you're a liar. God meets my needs. Amen? Amen. Look what it says here in verse 11, chapter 11. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of woman, there has not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. The violent are storming. They're, 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 you know, we're not, listen, we're not, we're not, you know, violent with people. No, thereat the man worketh not the righteousness of God. We're, we're getting violent with the devil. We're getting violent in faith in the name of Jesus. In a, I'm telling you, I don't know how many times I've had to get violent. I've shared stories. When the, when the spirit, do you understand? When the spirit of faith rises up, now I'm talking about the gift of faith rises up in a man's heart. He does things that are in the natural seems extremely violent. Smith Wigglesworth, people don't understand him. You understand, I, I, I've read all, every book that they've ever put out about Smith. The, 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 the one most powerful book I ever read about Smith was, a, was actually his sermons, because in his sermons he shared his heart. And, and, and Smith had such a heart for people, he couldn't stand to watch them sick and diseased and afflicted. I mean, he'd walk down the streets, he'd see someone crippled, he wouldn't let them stay in that condition, but he'd get violent. The spirit of violence would come upon his heart, and he'd punch him in the stomach with cancer. He was punch Punching the devil, and when he punched them, they would get healed. No, they were healed. So don't you dare be punching somebody in the stomach unless you know it's a spirit of faith. I, I, I broke my foot here some years ago, and I told you the story. I was laying in bed. My foot's all swollen up, and the spirit of God spoke to me. and said, what are you doing laying in bed? I thought you believed I'm he you're healed. And the spirit of faith rose up in my heart with a broken foot, got my broken foot back, my swollen foot back into my shoe, and my wife was doing the laundry in our, in, in our bedroom. And the, and the spirit of God rose up in me, and I took my foot because I about blacked out when I stood on it, and I slammed my foot down as hard as I could on the floor. I said, in the name of Jesus, I'm healed. And I fell back on the bed. And my wife's watching this. I did it the second time I fell back on the bed. I did it the third time I fell back on my bed. My wife said to me, you're going to make me sick. I can't watch you do this. I did it the fourth time I fell back on my bed. The fifth time I slammed my foot down as hard as I could. It was instantly healed. The swelling was gone, and, my, and, and I went back to work. 
But see, that was a gift of faith that rose up in my heart. See, I'm telling you right now by the Holy Ghost, the gift of faith is about to be released in the body of Christ. That that which has happened in the past would say the Spirit of God was just but the beginning, the seed of that which I'm about to do in the future. For those who open their heart and their mind and would say, yes, Lord, I believe I receive, they shall apprehend and they shall take a hold of that which has been prophesied. For they shall go forth like mighty men and women through the land. They will leap over the wall and they will run through a troop and they will not become weary. For I will fill them with the spirit of wisdom and might and power and the enemy will flee before them. Are you ready for that gift of faith in the time of famine? Are you ready to be filled with a faith that does not know the word no or you can't? Huh? You know, sometimes when you're operating in that realm, you got to watch it because people don't understand where you're coming from. See, sometimes they think you're arrogant, but it's the spirit of faith rising up in you. It's like David when he went to face Goliath. His brother thought he had a spirit of pride, but actually he was a humble young man that was surrendered to God. Now, notice what, go back there now to Deuteronomy chapter 8, please. See, and, and actually, Christ, all that Jesus was doing was quoting something that, the, that was quoted by the Spirit of God to the children of Israel. Notice what it says in chapter 8 and verse 1. All the commandments which I command thee this day, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1, all the commandments which I command thee this day shall be observed to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the ways which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness. Now listen, so he says, listen, I, 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 this has been a, 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 the school of hard knocks. This has been a learning time, a teaching time, a training time. Do you know a lot of times we don't understand this. We're just going through, we're, we're not out of school yet. You know, I, I've been pastoring for almost 30 years and I'm finding out I'm still, I'm still in school. God's still trying to teach me. I, I know Brother Hagin. It, it, was, it wasn't until his late 50s that God began to really give him a voice in the body of Christ. Really didn't really give him a voice into his late 50s. Now, I, I, granted, God can, be, can use you as young men. He did me as a young believer. But I'm talking about to a place to where you can really be in leadership and help men and women fulfill their divine call and their divine destiny and notice what it goes on to say here he said i led thee in the wilderness why for 40 years to do what to humble you to knock the pride out of you uh or or let me say it this way the self-sufficiency um you, you know almost every every even in our schools today even in Christian schools, they're teaching people, you got to believe in yourself. You got to believe in yourself. No, I'm not saying you should have a low self-esteem, but you know what Paul said? We are those who have no confidence in the flesh. See, as long as you think it's about you, you will never get out of the way. It's not about you. It's about him. I, I don't, see, I don't have to have confidence in Mike Yeager. I have confidence in Christ who is in Mike Yeager. I got to hear, because I don't have no confidence in Mike Yeager. See, the Moses, matter of fact, do you know what Paul said? Paul said, when I came to you, I came to you in fear and trembling. Why would Paul say that? Because Paul says, I don't trust myself. He said, but I trust the one within me. See, I don't trust none of you, but I trust the Jesus in you. And I see that Jesus in you. I see that Jesus in you. Now, maybe, maybe you know, 10% Jesus, 90% flesh, or 50% Jesus, 50% flesh, but I see, I see Jesus in you. Tell your neighbor that. Thank God I see Jesus in you. And here all the time you've been telling him, I see the devil in you. How come we're always so negative? I see the devil in you. Well, I'll just say, how many times you, man, I see Jesus in you. You know, when, you're, when, when, you, when you see your wife or your husband praying or reading the Bible or, or passing out a track, or, it's amazing, you know, because we're, 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 we're trained in that way. We, we speak the negative but not the positive. Now, don't lie, you know. <laughs> you know? But, 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 but when you see something that, that needs to be, uh, uh, you know, encouraged, do it. But notice what it goes on to say here. He says, I brought you there to humble you. Now get a hold of this. I brought, you, I, I, I brought you to this place to where you would stop depending upon yourself. You would stop relying upon yourself. I brought you into this wilderness that you would become moldable and shapeable like, like clay in the hands of the potter. 
You know, some people just don't learn their lesson. You know what? They didn't have to be out there for 40 years. They did not have to be in the wilderness for 40 years. You know, some people just seem never get out of the wilderness. Why? Because they won't deal with, I want it my way. See, you know why Jesus only spent 40 days in the wilderness? Because his attitude was, Father, not my will be done, but let your will be done. Lord, when it comes to this job, when it comes to this house, when it comes to whatever your will is, when it comes to pastoring this church, when it, see, a lot of people, the reason why they didn't come out of the wilderness because they said, let our will be done. And God said, no, you got it. But see, Moses, he got to the place after 40 years in the wilderness before this. He said, not my will. He said, I tried it. I tried, I tried to deliver the Israelites. You know what? You can spend 40 years in the wilderness trying to do the will of God. Moses was trying to do the will of God. He perceived God was going to use him to deliver the Israelites, but what he didn't perceive is God first needed to humble him. And actually the Bible says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. In due season, he shall exalt you. So, you know what? Uh, you know, where there's, 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 there's pride and there's, there's strife and there's confusion. And a lot of times we're just, you know what? We're just so stubborn. And, and, and I, I wish I could tell you that, that, man, all the stubbornness that Mike Yeager used to have is gone, but my kids would stand up and start yelling, liar, liar, pants on fire. I mean, there's pride in me yet. Stubbornness. You know? You know what? You can even be proud in preaching the gospel. You can be arrogant in preaching the gospel, not meek. Paul, Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. But he had all authority. You know, it's a terrible thing when a proud man gets authority. They become dictators. But give a, give a humble man, a meek man. Now, I'm not, I'm not pacifist now. I'm talking about a meek. He's, he's moldable. He's shapeable. God, your will. Let your will be done. He seeks the face of the Lord before he makes a decision. And notice he said, I brought you into the winners what? To humble you and to prove you to know what was in thine heart. Well, wow, this, is, this is important. He already knew what's in their heart. He said that you might know what's in your heart. You don't know what's in your heart. Well, God knows my heart. Yeah, but you don't. <laughs> you don't know what's in your heart until you're under pressure. But when the pressure comes... And you can get bitter, and you can get ugly, and you can get mean, and you can get judgmental, and you can blame shift. But you're, you're, you're going to pass, and guess what? You're going to have to go around the mountain again. You know what? I don't know how many times I've been around the mountain. Aren't you about pretty tired of going around the mountain? You know, always blame shifting, always saying it's their fault. It's not my fault. It's her fault. It's his fault. It's, it's, it's the government's fault. It's, a, it, it's those preachers' faults, you know. It's the church I went to's fault. No, no. But listen, you, you don't, you don't, while well, everybody else is, is, is drowning in self-pity and, and moaning and griping and, and, and they're not, they're not, they're not going to come out of the wilderness. You, you don't, listen, you, you can live in that place of, 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 of victory because you're tired of going around the mountain. Okay, God, I'm tired of fighting you. I'm not going to fight you no more. I'm going to do what you said. That's where a lot of, that's where, you know, that's why America's in big trouble right now. Because it hasn't been doing it God's way. And you know what they've decided right now? They're even going further away from God. And, and so he says, I, I brought you into the wilderness to humble you, to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. Well, Pastor Mike, we don't have no commandments in the New Testament. What are you talking about? Jesus, the last thing he said in Matthew 28, go and teach all men everywhere to observe all things I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you even unto the ends of the world. Go teach all men. What has he commanded us? Well, I, I studied one time. Over, I found over 150 commandments that Christ gave us, over 150. But here's a commandment. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. There's a commandment. Forgive or I won't forgive you. That's a commandment. Huh? I mean, see, I'm telling you right now, you you got you to gotta do these commandments. How am I going to do it? By looking to Christ, by looking to Jesus. Lord, I, I, I can't love that person without your help, so help me, Lord. See, the, the problem is, not, is it's, not that, it's not that you don't acknowledge lack in your personality. You acknowledge it, but then you look to Jesus and you draw from him what you need to do it. See, you know, I, I, I was, I was, when I, I grew up, 
I never was taught how to be a public speaker. I'm not saying I'm a good public speaker now. I was never taught how to be in leadership. I was never taught how to be a pastor. I was never taught how to be apostolic and start churches. I was never taught any of these things. I was never taught how to put up a building and how to do all of this different stuff. You know what I had to do? When I came to these places where I knew I, I, didn't, I didn't have the ability, I had to go, God, help. I, I need you now. Because I don't know how to be a good daddy. If I, was a, if, I, if I become like my father was, that's the end of my kids and my wife and my marriage. If I'm just like my natural earthly daddy, I'm going to be like my heavenly daddy. So, Father God, show me. And the first thing he does is he takes me to the book. He says, okay, here it is. This is how you should be a father. This is how you should be a husband. This is how you should be a wife. This is how you should be a pastor. This is how you should be a believer. This is how you should be a, a disciple of Christ right here. And he says, I brought you into the wilderness in order that you might be humbled and acknowledge you need to be a doer of my word. Listen, you're never going to come out of your famine unless you become a doer of the book. Be a doer of the word and not a hearer, only deceiving your own selves. Now, there's times I came into a, a, a place of famine. I knew what to do, but I got this attitude. I just wasn't going to do it. And it got worse than, I, I, I remember, this is a true story. I remember Brother uh, Albert Willis was coming by, and Albert Willis is a real man of the word. And he lives in a realm a lot of people don't live, and they think they can just step into that realm, but they don't understand they don't have the same commitment he has. But anyway, so he was coming by, but I remember I got a little bit of chest congestion. And, and I knew I should have spoke the word. I knew by the stripes of Christ I'm healed. But I remembered as a little boy, because I had all kinds of sinus problems and congestion problems when I was a little boy, I remember my mom putting the Vicks vapor rub on my chest. And, 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 and I seen these commercials about rubitessin, you know, and the cough syrup, you know. And, and so I thought, well, you know, I could stand in the word, but I, I, I just, I, I just want to experience that. It sounds stupid, but this is the thought that got in my head. I just want to experience Vicks vapor rub once again on my chest as a little boy smelling it laying in bed. And I just want to experience Rupert Tesson going down my throat, you know, nice and hot, you know, and, you know, and so I went out and got the vapor, uh, the, the, the Vicks vapor rub, and I went out and got the Rubitessin or whatever it is, and I took it and I rubbed my chest on and I, and I took it and, and you know what? It set into my body and I was sick for three months. And Albert Willis was here during that time, and I turned, told Albert what I did. He just laughed at me. He said, well, you got what you wanted, didn't you? He said, you've been experiencing it now, vapor rub and that cough medicine and that decongestant. You've been experiencing it and just having a wonderful time for the last three months. Now, it's one thing if you don't know better. You've never been taught. A lot of people don't, are, are never taught how to get victory. They're never taught how to overcome. They're never taught how to, how to walk on the water. But you know, when you, when you know it, how many of you have ever known better and you still did it? <laughs> oh, God. But aren't you glad for his mercy? So he said, I did this to humble you, that, to prove you, to know what's in your heart, that you keep my commandments. Verse 3, he says it again. He humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger. Now, up to this time, it's all been bad news. But now notice, here God steps in. What was he going to do in the famine? Listen what he did. He said, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee to know that man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord does man live. So I want you to see what, the, the, what happens here. God is setting us up for a supernatural visitation. When you come into the wilderness, when you come into the famine, when you come into the hardship, don't pray for it. Don't believe it. You'll have enough of them. But when it comes, get excited. Because God is about to show up. And God said, you know what? I'm going to take away the natural food for I can give you the supernatural food. I'm taking away the natural water source to give you a supernatural water source. He said, not only that, I'm going to save you tons of money. You ain't going to have to go to Sears and Roebuck. You ain't going to have to go to J.C. Penney's. You ain't going to have to go down and buy a new pair of Reeboks. Because notice what it says in the next verse. Verse 4, the, thy raiment wax not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these 40 years. Oh, but Pastor Mike, I want to have more than one pair of shoes. I want to have more than one dress. I want to have more than one shirt. I want to have one more pair of pants. 
Okay, I understand that. But you need to see what God is saying here. If God kept them, let me tell you something too. They didn't stink either. God, this is old covenant. God said, I brought you to a place where natural flesh couldn't help you no more. You had to look to me. You know, it's like a mother bird finally taking its young one and throwing it out of the nest. Saying, okay, now you're going to have to trust me. How, how many of you are coming into the place where you know you have to trust God or you're not going to make it? You know it. I mean, I know some of what you're all going through, some. What you're going through, you've told me. And God's got to come through. I mean, we've been that way. Uh, I've always told people it's a bad confession. It's probably my fault. We're a snorkel church. Our nose is just always above the water, you know. But I, I've, I, I've had to believe God for years and years and years. My kids will tell you. My wife will tell you. Otherwise, we would have never made it. And people believe God with us. But a lot of times when you're behind the driver's seat, it's like, you know, you're driving a car and you're really getting tired and, and, and everybody, everybody's a passenger and they all can sympathize with your driving, but they're all sleeping, snoozing. You know what I mean? It's like when you're the one who pays the bills in the house and you're the one who has to put out the money and everybody's, oh, God, meet our needs, honey. And she goes out and buys another pair of shoes and another dress or vice versa. Or he goes out and, you know, and, and she's the one who pays the bills and it's like lacks a day. Oh, yeah, I don't have to pay the bills. You got, But I'm leaving God with you. No, you're not. You're just letting your flesh go. But see, I brought you to this place where you're going to either get bitter or better. You're either going to flow more in the Holy Ghost or you're going to get more in the flesh. See, it's the pendulum. Where are you going to go here now, beloved? You're going to go into the Spirit. You're going to trust God. You're going to believe God. You're going to get, you're going to get the word hid in your heart. Let, let's finish up here. Notice what it goes on to say here. He says, I want you to know, I had to get you to a place where you had to learn you don't live by natural means. You do all that you can do in the natural. If a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. You do what you do in the natural, but now you look to God for the rest. See, the little boy with the fishes and the loaves, he gave what he had, but then God multiplied it. You do what you can to the best of your ability. You don't worry. I heard a tremendous, uh, Brother Hagen's gone home to the Lord a long time ago, uh, Papa Hagen, but he's still on our radio station, and he was talking the other day how he was in a financial situation, and he was preaching in a little church, and this little church was telling him, well, you know, the most amount we've ever raised, you know, for a guest speaker is $90 a week, you know, that's the most, and he was there doing a three-week revival. He needed $300 a week just to meet his natural needs, and they're telling him, and he said, listen, Whatever you do, I don't want you in a pulpit. I don't want you begging for money for us. And he didn't tell the pastor how much he needed. He said, I just want you to simply say, we're going to receive an offering now for Brother Hagen. That's all I want you to say. I don't want you to say. See, these guys spent hours and hours raising money. Brother Hagen, you know, well, he didn't do that. He said, just, we're just, I'm just going to believe God. I'm just going to believe God. You know, I've always thought it's funny how, how people who say they're believing God go around and tell everybody their needs. <laughs> you know, oh, pray for me. I need a thousand bucks. Oh, I need a thousand bucks. You got a thousand bucks. I need a new car. Oh, pray. I need a new car. I need a car. You got a new car for me? You know, and it's kind of a, it's a little bit of fishing. And I'm not, you know, if you've done that, I don't blame you. I've done it too. But Brother Hagen didn't do that. He just, he wouldn't tell the man his need. He just said, hey, listen. He said, um, he said he needed $300. And so he said he, he went to go to bed one night and, 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 and he, the casting all your cares on the Lord. And he said he, said he went to cast his care on the Lord on his, with his right hand, but it, it, was, it was stuck to his hand like fly paper. He, he couldn't get the care off. Couldn't get the care off. Couldn't get the care off. And so he, he tried to go to sleep, and he woke up, and that was in both hands. He couldn't get it. Got to get the care off. He couldn't get, you know, it was stuck to his hands like, like, like fly paper. Couldn't get the care off. He knew he had to get to the place to where he could finally give it to the Lord. When I say not having an I don't care, I don't care if I don't pay the bills. See, don't, don't get that. Right now, if you owe the credit card companies, you owe the banks, don't get this attitude. Don't be a thief. I don't care if I pay them. They're a bunch of crooks anyways. 32% interest. Well, how do you know that, Pastor Mike? Because that's how I've been talking. <laughs> Bunch of crooks. You know, no. What you got to do is you got to cast your care. He said he finally got to the place to where he got a release. <sighs> now, is it going to try to come back? Yeah. So what do you do? You got to go back. You got to go back to war. See, I'm talking about prayer. 
we, that's a whole nother sermon, man. You got to fight the good fight in the realm of prayer. I mean, you got to fight that spiritual warfare in prayer, man. And I'm telling you, you can't believe I've spent many more hours walking the floor. But, you know, a lot of times preaching is but the tip of the iceberg, or it should be, of a minister's life. I mean, I, I, I would, I, I, you know, there's been times I average. I'm not bragging. I have averaged sometimes, you know, 40 to 50 to 60 hours a week in prayer for a 90-minute message. And, you know, if you spend 40, 50 hours a week in prayer, it's kind of hard to shut up after 90 minutes. And then, and, then, and then, of course, you don't say, people come to you, oh, Pastor Mike, we, we really need to pray. We need to really pray. And I go, yep, I know it. Yep. Yeah, because I know it. Amen. It's like saying, we got to breathe. We got to breathe. Well, hello. And let me tell you, I'm, you know, look what it says here. He says, thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Oh, God doesn't chasten us still. Oh, we'll get into that tonight. It says, so the Lord doesn't chasten you. He said, you're, 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 you're an illegitimate child. Yeah, you're going to go through times. It is times of chastisement. Why? He's trying to get you in the word. He's trying to get you in the word. He's trying to get you in prayer. He's trying to get you to come to him. He's trying to get you to look to him. He's trying to get you to reach out to him. But they've made it so easy in our society to reach out to this, this, and this, and this, but God. But what's going to happen, listen, what's going to happen, you know what, do you know why you can get so many results when you go to third world countries and getting people healed? They have nowhere else to go. That's the simple fact. They're living in a wilderness. They're living in a desert. They're living in a place where there is no doctors. There is no hospitals. There is no medical society. And the only ones you get it are the wealthy. And so when you go and you preach by his stripes, you're healed. They grab a hold of it. They run with it because they don't have anywhere else to go. Listen, I'm just saying me personally, personally. I never told you this. That's why I've never had health insurance. I've been offered it. The first church, the second church, I pastor only God church, they paid for my health care. My wife and I were just married. I made them cancel it. I said, you keep the money, don't need it. Now, why would you do that, Pastor Mike? And my wife was in agreement. I wanted to keep myself in the place where I had to believe God. And he's always helped me. Now, don't you go canceling your health insurance because <laughs> you might need it. Hello? Don't you be condemned, but I'm just telling you, we're going to get to the place. Do you know, I'm telling you what right now, pray for wisdom for those in authority. Because right now, I don't know if you know this, but they're trying to pass, it's called a Freedom and Choice Act. And that's where abortion is going to have to be practiced across board to every state including private hospitals, doctors, nurses. Listen, the, the, and there's a lot of Catholic hospitals. There's a lot of Christian private hospitals in America, a lot of them. They take a lot of the weight off of the regular secular hospitals. Listen, they came out this week, and the Catholic authorities have said this. If they pass this Freedom and Choice Act, they are shutting down their hospitals. St. Joseph's, a lot of these, they're shutting down. No, we're talking about where a lot of people are getting all kinds of help. What are they going to do? Listen, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have to begin to believe God. You're going to have to, whether you like it or not. You know what? I really don't want to trust God a lot of times. I really don't. I don't want to be in that pressure cooker. I don't want to be in that desert. I don't want to be in that wilderness. But you know what? It's just like when I was a little boy. I didn't want to, I didn't want to eat my turnips and my broccoli and my, and my spinach. I didn't want to eat it, but I'm glad I did. You're going to have to grow up whether you want to or not. Amen? You know? You're going to have to be pushed out of your little nest. <laughs> Amen. Well, look, look, look what it says here. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. Verse 7, for the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains, of depths that spring out of the valleys and hills, of land of wheat and barley, of vines, fig trees, of pomegranates, a land of oil, olive, and honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. Thou shalt not lack anything in a land. 
man, whose stones are iron. And, 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 and out of the hills thou shalt mayest dig. But listen, it goes on and on and on. It, it, when, when is that, Pastor Mike? As you come out of your wilderness. See, that's revival. That's revival, brothers. And sisters. Are you ready for that land of promise? Now there's a place where you still got to fight. You still got to wrestle. You still got to defeat. But listen, you're coming out of that scarceness. You're coming out of that lack. You're coming out of that poverty. You're coming out of that famine into this, this land of abundance of milk and honey and weed and oats and barley and vineyards and flowing streams and, and bread without scarcity. I mean, you're coming into a place of, of victory. Uh, you know, I watch, I watch people who've gone through this. I've watched people go through the hard times and then they've been faithful and they've been obedient. They've done the will of God and they come out and then they, they just, I mean, it's just like a rocket. They head to the stars and everybody looks and says, oh, I want to be just like that. Well, you don't want to go through what they went through though. See, nobody talks about the years that Brother Hagen had to drive his car and his tires had no thread at all on them. He drove his car for years because he didn't even have enough money to get to get new tires he drove his car with nothing but just just bald tires just believe in God that they weren't gonna gonna have a flat. Just believe in God to, get to to you know just you know. And he was faithful. He didn't grumble. He didn't gripe. He didn't complain. He didn't moan. He didn't groan. Well, I'm sure he did at times, you know. <laughs> but the thing is, is that he he kept us. God's will, God's will, God's will. I can do it. I have it. God said it. And you know what? And God finally brought him to a place where he just came into this time of such six amazing. I watched it. Amazing, amazing influence in the body of Christ. And because of his faithfulness, there is thousands of churches now across the world of the students that have come through his Bible school. And that's just one man. That's not including Earl Roberts. That's not including uh, other men of God that have walked with the Lord. But they had to go through that time. Now, how long do you want to live in the wilderness? <laughs> how long do you want to stay there? Huh? Because I'm telling you what, you got one or two choices as God's people. Either you're going to die in the wilderness, or you can live in the wilderness, or you can come out of the wilderness. How are we going to do it, Pastor Mike? Well, we're going to do it God's way. And we're going to come out in a glorious style. We're going to come out victorious. We're going to come out overcoming. See, actually, Brother, uh, and I just use men as examples, Brother Smith Wigglesworth, he went through a time of real famine in his life, if you study his life. But when he hit 48 years old, it's not a magical date, by the way. See, I saw it was 40, 40, 52. I thought when he hit 52 years old, that's, and so I couldn't wait till I hit 52. Well, 52 came and went, and then I found out it was 48, so I missed my time, right? No. <laughs> There's not a magical can I tell you right now, young people, there's not a magical age. It's not like when you hit 30, all of a sudden, God's going to come on you. No, it's any time, any place, as long as you do it his way. And so at 48 years old, Smith had really grown cold in his heart towards God. He had been through church anity. He had been through the politics of what goes on. He had been through all of this mess. But Smith just decided, you know what? I've been a plumber, I've raised my kids, I've got all this, it doesn't matter, I'm going all the way for God. And Smith did. And at 48 years old, almost for the next, almost 50 years, Smith just went for God. And I mean, and God used him in an awesome way, because he just decided, I'm going to do it God's way. I'm going to do it God's way. Now, he was a nominal Christian up to that time. See, I believe that what God is going to do, I really do. He's going to raise up Smith Wigglesworth, John G. Lakes, Alexander Dowies, uh, 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 Mary Woodworth Edders, Catherine Coleman. So I'm just using these names as warriors that have gone on with God. Not, they weren't perfect people, but they, they paid the price. They went through the fire, and God used them. Amen? Are you ready? Huh? Are you, see, you're in the fire right now, whether you like it or not. I mean, you are, I know, in my heart, you're in the, you're in the fire. You're in a, you're, you're in a rock and a hard place. But in that wilderness, God can cause water to spring up out of the rocks. God can cause manna to come down from heaven. And God can cause your clothes to, to stop wearing out. God can step in and start doing the miraculous. And you can come out of that valley, the shadow of death, strong in Jesus. And who gets the glory? He does. You know what? You'll, you'll, you'll wake up one morning and say, you know what, God? You do do what you say you do. I mean, how many, and don't forget your experiences. He told the Israelites, don't 
Forget. Don't forget what I've done for you. Think about all the wonderful miracles God has done for you. How many have ever had God do a miracle for you? I mean, you have. You have. Okay, reflect on those things. And then it just say, hey, you know, there's more where that came from. And God wants to do it. Amen. Well, give the Lord a hand clap and a shout. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm telling you, man, we're, we're, as we come through this time period, and I think it's into the glorious return of Jesus, into the sounding of the trumpet, the taking away of the body of Christ. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you know, I, I got a revelation. I know the Bible says the last will be first. I know that. But I didn't have the revelation that he meant that when it comes to the end of the ages. God has reserved the best to the last. I don't know. Have you ever complained about the time period we live in? Oh, God, why'd you let me in this time period? Why couldn't I live in a time period when, you know, it was easy to serve you? No, God's kept the best to last. <laughs> and the last will be first. And the first will be last. And God has kept the best to last. And so don't get this attitude, oh, there's no room anymore for people to really move in God. No, there's so much room you can't believe it. Believe that God's God. But now remember, it, just understand, count the cost. Jesus said count the cost and pay the price. There's a price to be paid to get where you need to be spiritually. And, it's, and, and almost all of this molding, this shaping, this forming, this fashioning is done in the backside of the desert where nobody can see what you're going through. All they see is when all of a sudden you're up there and God is really flowing, God's really moving, God's really touching, God's really healing. But they don't see all the stuff that you had to do behind closed doors where you struggled and you wrestled and you fought. Jacob had to wrestle with God before his name was changed to Israel. Are you ready? Let's pray. Father, shoo, mm, shoo. Lord, I, I just sense in my heart right now there's people in here Lord, they just need to be strengthened in the Holy Ghost. Yes, they're in the battle of, of their life. They're in the fight of their life. And, and Lord, they have fought battles, and they have fought the good fight. And, and Lord, but, uh, but there's a weariness, and there's a tiredness, and there's, a, there, there's a, 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 a just a, a, even a discouragement at times that try, try to come upon them. And I, I pray, Lord, even this morning, that by the Holy Ghost, Lord, whew, the Holy Ghost, Lord, whew, I tell you, just when I say that, I mean the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, Lord. Whew. I tell you, the Spirit of God would want you to know that, that there are those of you here this morning that, that the Holy Ghost is stronger and more real, and he's done a bigger work inside of you than what you've given him credit for. He's, he's, and, 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 and there's more inside of you than you even understand or know. There's more inside of you. There's more, there's more capacity in you. You, 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 you. Because you've looked at yourself, you've underrated what God wants to do, what God can do, and what God will do even now. And, and it's like God wants you to step up to the, to the home plate, pick up the bat, and take another swing. <laughs> God wants you to run out there, and, and, and as the quarterback throws another, an, another pass, he wants you to run out there and, and, and grab a hold of that ball and run across the goal lines. And, and I just sense in my, in my heart this morning, there's, there's, there's a number of you that you, you, you're in the midst of a battle, and you know that God is the answer, he's the solution, but you just want him to strengthen you in the inner man for you will fulfill what God has called you to do. If that's you, come up here right now and just stand up here, and I, I just want to lay hands on you right now. You just, man, you know what God's called you to do. You, you, you're in the midst of a battle. You know that God is doing something wonderful, but you just want God to strengthen you on the inner man. He just wants to, you just sense that God wants to strengthen you and just stand up here and, uh, and, and uh, just line up along the tape there. And I want you to, I just want you to reach your hands towards heaven and begin.